Stream of consciousness. I could start that now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> hey, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Martinez. I'm the director here of MySec Lansing. I'm very excited about uh, our guest speaker that we have today. I'll, I'll introduce him in a moment. Uh, very quickly, I want to go through some announcements. Uh, since we have a newsletter now, which if you're not signed up for the newsletter, please give me your email address. And I'm going to sign you up for our newsletter. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into that. Uh, but since we have a newsletter, I'm not going to go through all of the meetups that we normally do. I'm just going to give you the MySec meetups. Uh, <laughs> yesterday in Jackson, we had uh, lightning talks, uh, which were pretty cool. Check out the YouTube stream of that. Um, I will give you the talk names because there's some fun ones in there. Sometimes vulnerability analysis isn't as complicated as you'd expect. Uh, for the love of EDR, an introduction to PHP and why it's insecure. So like I said, definitely go check out the YouTube stream of that. Um, of course, we're here today. Uh, again, I'll, I'll get to our guest in a moment. <laughs> uh, Detroit is on hiatus for the time being, but look for something next year. And Grand Rapids, they actually just changed on me very last moment here. Grand Rapids had something planned for tomorrow, but now they're going to be doing a KringleCon prep. Uh, which will be very interesting. I don't know that they'll be streaming that, given that it's uh, the format, but if you're interested in uh, doing KringleCon, you might want to go head out to Grand Rapids tomorrow. Uh, let me see here. If you guys didn't already hear, uh, we do not have recordings for B-Sides, unfortunately. There was a technical problem. Uh, but if you have questions about getting slides or getting in contact with the speakers, reach out to us on Slack. Uh, we will definitely help out as best we can. Let's see what else we got. Boy, I have some old announcements on this thing. It's talking about our barbecue. <laughs> that happened long ago. Um, thank you very much. Yes, Converge 2020. It's going to be, what is it, April? May 14th and 15th. It was a different conference I was looking at. May 14th and 15th. Early bird tickets are on sale now, so be sure to get those and save yourself some money. All right, with that said, I'll get to our speaker now. We've got uh, Steve. I'm sorry, Steve or Steven? Uh, Steve, fine. Steve Freak Show. Freak Show Telco on Slack there. You might have seen him around. Steve Freak Show Landon. Uh, he is here to present on retro telephones in a modern VoIP age, and I'm very excited that he's here. Oh, thank you. Uh, he brought a lot of great equipment. Uh, he's got a little presentation he's going to do, and we'll get to uh, do some hands-on stuff and, and play with some of the toys that he brought. And with that... Take it away, Steve. All right. I'm Steve. Uh, my background in phones is I, I grew up in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, when it was fun to mess with pay phones and do all the stuff, whether it be red box and a phone. Uh, my grandfather gave me my first red box and told me, he said, when you figure out what it is, come talk to me. And, well, I figured out what it was quick, and I was able to make, uh, I was able to make uh, prank phone calls with it from a pay phone down the, uh, down the street from my grandpa's house for free. So... But I was, I've always been into computers and telecom. I, just, it, I used to sneak online in the middle of the night and jump the pair to get, get on the Internet from the side of the house or jump on the neighbor's pair. So that's a little about me. This is my fiance Ashley. She's a little bit shy. <laughs> so I, I brought a number of phones for everybody to play with. There's, I even got a Japanese pay phone. So, but we'll go ahead and get started if this thing will behave itself. All right, so let's say you got a phone, you got an old rotary phone, and you want to hook it to a, a SIP provider or call centric or whatever you have for your uh, voice over IP service. What you're going to need is a uh, Pulse compatible analog telephone adapter. Grandstream HT802 is one of them. The, I will say that it doesn't provide just uh, doesn't provide enough ring current to really ring the bells loud. So the HT502 is a better choice. That's good for if you have one one or for two phones because it supports one or two lines. Then if you have more than one phone, you can do your own PBX. I mean, you can go hog wild. You can go as big as you want. And you'll need a, you just take an old Core 220 box you got laid around, throw an asterisk on it or a Raspberry Pi. Then you can connect your analog telephone adapter to that. Then when you set that up, you can call from room to room. So it's always good. It's fun to have phones from room to room. So let's say you got kids and you don't want them screaming. Tell them to dial the extension to the living room. And then uh, another, another way to go is you can get a channel bank and a T1 PCI interface for asterisk, and that gives you 48, channel, uh, 48 channels to work with if you have two, two T1s cards in the system. So you can 
big as you want. I had a Nevada Definity that I ran for a while, and that supported 48 lines. The noise was unbearable, and the power bill was through the roof, so I switched down, migrated down to a channel bank and asterisk. So what we got here is we've got the, uh, the, the TDM 400 card is uh, just a regular analog card that gives you four, four, four extensions. But there's a number of T1 interfaces that are compatible with asterisk. I prefer the Sangoma cards. They work plug and play. You don't have to mess with anything. So that's, uh, that's basically all there is to it. And we'll get into the asterisk configuration here in a minute. Now what I'm going to demo first is CNET, the collector's, uh, the collector's net. All right, back in 04, a bunch of guys got together. They have all this really cool switching gear from the return of the century up to the, up to the late 60s and 70s before they went all electronic. They restored it, and it was all working. They wanted a way to connect it on the Internet. So what they did is they started messing with Asterisk, and they, uh, with a little bit of work, uh, they had Asterisk uh, as working as a tandem to their switches. So they put a, a scheme in place and developed a office codes and an automated method of looking up for calls, and they've built this huge network that you can call, dial around on and play with. It's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, they've got, I had my defendant do it. I had, uh, I know a guy, you walk uh, to a friend of mine's basement in Cincinnati, and it's just wall-to-wall -wall switching gear. It looks like a central office out of 1940. And the noise is just, it's cool. Seeing all the, seeing all the relays click and all that. So if this thing's behaving itself, we'll make a test call on CNET so you can see what she does. This is a Northern Telecom display phone, by the way. These were made in 83 for the executive that wanted to have a data terminal on their desk. Uh, yep. Turn her on. Line one. Then it should connect the call. Takes a minute for it to process, and the number you have dialed of course. is not in service. <laughs> number and try again. Of course. Seven, three, eight, five. Oh, I dialed it wrong. <laughs> Oops. Ah, come on, stupid thing. Now it should work. This is one of the test numbers on CNET, so you can test the full range of your phones. But that gives you an idea. That's that's just one of the numbers on CNET. I'll pull up the directory in a minute so you can see the whole scheme of it. Because there's tons of stuff to call around to. So that's just one of the test numbers. All right. Let me disconnect from the Pi. All right. So. First, before we uh, pull up the directory, this, this kind of shows you how to connect to CNET. So you can use a cell phone with an analog telephone adapter like what we have up here. Or you can use even a soft phone on your PC, like X-Link or whatever you, whatever you prefer. You can use an old electromechanical key system, which is the old multi-line phones from the 70s and 80s that give you five lines. And them are really cool to play with. They flash. They do all kinds of cool stuff. You can, you can hook up a thing like a Marine One or a Big Definity or Anything you got, you can hook to it. Or if you have step, step equipment or other electromechanical switching equipment, you can hook right up to it. All right, so how Asterisk works is, the CNET works, is you'll pick up the phone here on the originating end. It'll receive dial tone from whatever you're using for the legacy PBX. Mine's, you don't have to dial 8 to get out on CNET. But then you receive dial tone from the Asterisk switch. Then you dial the country code and the number, which for the North American number plan is one to dial out. And then uh, the asterisk switch uh, makes a DNS query to see how to route the call. 
and then the, your DNS server handles the routing information, responds to the routing information. Then the originating tandem connects the terminating tandem via IP connection. And the receiving end looks at its own routing tables and determines that the call should be passed via an, F, uh, via an FX connection, which is one of your phone ports. And then, uh, and then the terminating PBX will supply dial tone or a direct connection to whatever they got. So, and then the station at the other end will ring. So, like uh, that was someone's that was a recording on someone's asterisk switch. So when you dialed the when you dialed that, it went through and looked it all up and rang the extension on their asterisk switch. And then this is how it works for the analog telephone adapter. So it's pretty much it's a little, it's a little bit the same. There's no PBX in the middle. So there's really not much to it. It's it just basically they use DNS to route the numbers. All right. Now this is uh, this is my first system. This is Navaya Definity G3 compact modular cabinet. I mean, it's big, it's expandable, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. You can do wireless phones with it. They made wireless phones, they made door phones, they made emergency restroom phones, all kinds of stuff. The only thing I didn't like about it was it was a power sucking hog. I mean, it jumped my power bill 90 bucks a month to run it. And the fans were just, it was a wind tunnel in my office when I was running it. So this is my current setup right here. It's got you've got you've got the uh, the asterisk boxes on the floor, but then we, it comes from T1 up to the 88600 channel bank, which those are amazing by the way. They're dirt cheap on eBay, and then it goes up to the 66 blocks. Each 66 block gives me 23 extensions to work with, and then those go out to the rest of the house. I've got phones in every room. And then I've got a Western Electric 551B key system, which is those old multi-line telephones. So if I push a line on that, it gets dial tone from my asterisk switch. So I can call out on the old rotary multi-line phones. So, but if you, uh, but the way, to, the best way to get started, if you, if you already got a channel bank laying around and a T1 card, that's the way to go because you've got plenty of expandability. This is the 551B key system. That's the multi-line phones. And what will happen is when a call comes in, the li the line light will flash. So there's Mine supports three lines in an intercom, so whichever line is getting a call, that line will flash. So you just push the line button, pick it up, and you can get answer the call. Or if you put it on hold, the line, the line light will flash, let you know your call's on hold. Now this was before hold music or anything, so the person on hold just got silence. But nice thing about 1A2 is it, it, you, there is hold. There's all kinds of modules you can add to it, buzzers, you name. It. So that's that's another rabbit hole that it's fun to dive down. All right, this is our 1D2 payphone in our living room. This is your bog standard fortress payphone that you've seen. Nice thing is you can uh, you open them up, which if you don't have keys, they're a pain. You need a hammer drill to uh, bust the locks. But then you just hook up tip and ring to points L1 and L2, and you're good to go. You can use it as a regular phone off anything. The coin function doesn't work. But they do make a payphone controller for it, but they're about 300 bucks. This is my Western Electric 555 PBX switchboard. This came out of the uh, Detroit Produce Terminal. We found it up in we found it up in Gaylord. A guy had it. Came with all the documentation and the drawings. And basically, in the old office days, an operator would sit here and route calls instead of the PBX doing it. An operator would sit there and do it. This one's all hooked up and working. It, when a call comes in. You'll take one of the cords and answer it and plug it in the trunks. And you just flip the, th flip the lever, and it takes the call. You can also dial out on it. It's basically a big telephone, the 555. It's standalone, so you don't need a whole entire switch room of equipment to run it. Oh, boy. That must have been fun to play with. Oh, no. Oh no! This is a Northern Telecom Centurion payphone, commonly found in Canada, over the northeastern United States. That's another easy one to hook up once you bust the lock. If you don't have keys, just tip and ring to points L1 and L2, and away you go. 
So if you if you want if you want to get into pay phones, those are about things to do. All right, this is her uh, phone booth. This is actually her 233 G, or Western Electric 233 G. The booth is from about 1955, 56, and the phone is from 1960. Those are a little bit harder to wire up, but the nice thing about telephone collecting is there's this wonderful organization called Telephone Collectors International, and they have all the bell system practices scanned in there so you can look them up. All the drawings, anything you want, right there. So that's it for that. We'll go ahead and pull up the CNET directory and we'll show you some of the stuff you can see with CNET. All right. Let me get this to behave itself. All right. Wi Fi's back on. I guess I can end the slideshow with that. All right, this is this, uh, if it's going to behave itself, what happened? Oh, there she goes. All right, so this is the, this is the U.S. phone. <laughs> All right, so this is the CNET member directory. There is members all over the world, and this is all the stuff you can call and play with. So I'll scroll down a little bit. We can call a we can call a time and date. We can call a let's find a let's find an ANAC uh, automatic number identification. That's what ANAC is. Let's see if we can find one. Uh, there, uh, not that we know of, but there is. But they did. Uh, they did have a speak. They did have a speaking clock that was automated back in the 40s and 50s. It just ran on a magnetic drum. Okay. All right, let me find a. Let me find an automatic number ID. Two, three, one, three, five. All right. So I'll hop on the display phone. It's the only thing I brought with a speakerphone. Call Naveen Albert. He's a really good. He's a really good kid with this stuff. And let me get that number again. I want. Of course, I didn't do it fast enough. Right, where's Naveen's? I want to do CLID readback 2311035. Now, if this works, it'll read back my caller ID information that I supplied in my Astra server and the number that I have attached to it. That's the recordings of Pat Fleet that they were able to get for their switch. And Pat Fleet does all the voice recordings, does the AT&T guy, all the AT&T voices, all the Verizon, all that stuff. But then we have, there's like, there's old, you can listen to old dial tones from the uh, 40s and 50s. Let's see what else good Naveen has on here. Uh, I'm to find a city, there's city dial tone. City, there's city dial tone two three one one zero one two. All right, so this will give you an idea of what city dial tone sounded like in the my 1950s. That's the old dial tone from the 1950s. That's how it used to sound. It was all electromechanically generated. So this was no computers back then. All right. 
Yeah. <laughs> then we'll give you the old we'll give you the old city busy tone so you can see what that one's like. And this will give you, this is what the busy tone sounded like that back then. Well, that's not doing it right. Looks like Naveen's switch is being a pain. I wanted a uh, ring, I wanted a busy tone. Yep, that's what I gave it. Well, I'll see what the ring back works. All right, this is what the old ringback sound will sound like. If it goes through. That's what the ringback would have sounded like. So that's that gives you an idea of that's that's just some of the things that you can play with on CNET. There is a lot to, there's a lot. I mean, there, there's a time and temperature lady if you decide you want to call the time and temperature. There's, people have got their own, I'll scroll down a little bit further. He's, this kid Naveen has got like 200, 200 extensions he's built up. He's lucky he just got to tour a central office with a DMS 500 switch in it. So, let's see if, oh, this is all Naveen's. Then there's the Seattle Museum, the Connections Museum. That's a tele telecommunications out in Seattle, Washington. That's supposed to be amazing to see. They got a restored, they got a, a number of restored switches. So that's CNET. And then if you want to see what the call looks like going through asterisk on the console, we can pull that up. And then we'll get the toys out and get the stuff. Out. So I'll go ahead. And this is using asterisk on the console is wonderful for debugging stuff too. So you type in asterisk dash R V V V V and that gives you extreme verbosity. So now we can call that, we can dial one of those uh, means numbers, and then you can see what it does on the console. Then you'll see what it, then you'll see on the console what it, it'll show up show the whole call path that works. And that that goes to the CNET macro and kind of shows you how it connects and everything. Turn that annoying noise off. But that's it. So that's something that's a lot to play around with if you have time to do it. So now we can get the toys out. So let me just turn the Wi-Fi off on the Pi, and we're good to go. And then I'll then then all the phones should start working. So that's it. Wi-Fi off. I'll just punch mine in at home so it has it.
Now you don't have to have a hardware, but you don't have to have a full, uh, full machine if you don't want to run Asterisk in a machine or a Pi. You can run in a virtual machine using ATAs. So if you got a dedicated VM box, that's the way to go. That's one. Then while that's rebooting, I'll show you some of the phones we have. So we've got, I just, I just, this is, the, all right, this is a Japanese payphone. All right, so this is a Japanese payphone. I just got this one. I don't know hardly anything about it. All I know is I need 100 volts to run it, and I can't run it here in the States because it requires a specific voltage, and it also requires 50 hertz ringing current, which I can't give it. So it's a pretty display piece. And this is a Dutch telecom phone. They use the uh, multi-frequency tones, A, B, C, D, like what the military uses on their system over there. This one's a speaker phone. I've got to make an adapter so you can use it. Here's an Australian touch tone phone. Then we have a Western Electric 500, which is your common bog standard rotary dial phone. This is an early one from 1950. It's got the metal dial. And the way to identify these is you just flip them upside down. And then you see the date. It'll show you the date on the bottom of it. So this one was done in January of 1955. So that's how you identify the, all, all the Western Electric, Northern Electric, and Automatic Electric products. There's always a date on the bottom of it. So then we have another uh, Australian uh, rotary phone. Then here's some test sets. This is a, just a pin dialer, or just a butt set from around 1940. Then we have the Northern Telecom version of it, which the Canadians used, which is based on a Contempora phone. And this guy I just got, it's a, it's a South, Southwestern Bell test, uh, test phone. So it had uh, modem numbers it would call into to provision stuff. It was still, all the data was still intact on it, so what, that was fun to find. And then we have another, uh, we have another uh, Lyman's butt set. from. They used these up until the 70s and 80s. And this is the 314A trunk test set, the Ma, the Ma Bell blue box. So... This one, actually, this one actually works. So if I put it in manual mode, oh, come on, let's behave. I can actually make it play tones while it's supposed to. I'll take it off hook first, work with it better. You can't do much with it, it's a giant music box now, but still. And then uh, let's, say you wanna, let's say you wanna be like Captain Crunch and send 2600 hertz. Switch it to, there's 2600 hertz like they used in the blue box days. So, and there is also a, let me turn off that sound, but there is a, a project called Project MF, which simulates uh, 26 multi-frequency controlled uh, trunks. So you can actually go and call this, call it up with your blue box and uh, sing, uh, uh, blue box trunks like you would back in the 80s and 70s. That's a lot of fun to play around with too. So that's that. Then we have your princess telephone, which was found in bedrooms, and you know every every girl had a pink one back then. What's cool about this one is it's got a dial light, so you, the dial light's on so at night, so you can see it. it's like a night light. So when you pick up the phone, the light gets brighter, so you can see what you're dialing at night. Then here's a later bog standard 500 set, and then we have everybody's seen these, the Con Air phones from the 80s. So it lights up when it, when it rings. Then we have the Northern Telecom display phone, which is what every executive had in the 80s for data communication purposes. And it, made a, it makes a good speaker phone. So now if, that the, now if the supply is back up, now we should be able to dial an extension and stuff should ring. Should.
that's ringing the princess phone. So you can go ahead and answer it. Hello? Testing. Yep, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all set up so you can dial, like, uh, uh, let me see what this one's on. It's got a sticker on it still. Just got this phone a few days ago. Oh, that dial's being sticky. I'm going to reset it. Nope, that one needs to be cleaned. So we got the 2500 or the 500 set. Oh, come on. I had all this tested before I came down here. Well, that should ring the display phone, I think. Nope, that doesn't ring the display phone. All right, that should ring that. Or the display phone. I can't remember which. Should yell at me. Sometimes it doesn't have enough ring current to ring that. Oh, geez. All right, so a <laughs> rotor. All right, so so what? Are, how a rotary dial phone works is it sends pulses to the uh, switch to the central office switch, and I could I could pull up a YouTube video so you can see how a central office switch works. But it's it's beyond my comprehension how it works. I just watch it work, and I think it's cool. But uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of good resources out there if you want to learn about step switching. So how, how do you dial? How do you dial? Okay. I think some of us know how to do it. But All right. For, for the viewers at home. All right. So to dial a phone, you pick your phone up, obviously, yep. and if this one's going to behave itself, you put you dial. So let's say we're going to call extension 2001, which is the princess. Dial two, zero, zero, one. That should ring the princess phone. Ryan, it's for you. I see. Hello? Oh, oh it's. No, this rings the last. Right? No, it's ringing the. the oh, the plunger's Thanks. stuck. Oh, I see. Test. Hello? Hello? Nope. Nope. Huh, that was weird. Well, it rings. Yeah. We're almost there. Yep. Then I gotta see what extension this is on. Like right. <laughs> Two, zero, zero, three should ring one of these two. Hmm. What am I ringing? Well, the ringer's not working on that now. All right. Let's try it again. Hmm. Well, the ringer died in this one on the way down. Well, that was a cool one to show off because it lights up when it rings. But that's how a rotary dial phone works. Then uh, if you've never heard of this thing called Lenny on Asterisk, it's a wonderful thing. that you It's it's to deal with telemarketers, but it's also a good time waster. So if you, gotta, if you wanna prank someone, three-way Lenny into the call and let them talk to the robot for a little bit. So like, we'll call Lenny. Hi, Lenny. Uh, sorry, I, I can barely hear you there. He just goes on and on and on and keeps you on the phone. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've gotten so many friends with Lenny, I talk to him for 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So he has a bunch of recordings to play. Hello, Lenny. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, someone, someone did, did say last week, that someone did call last week about the same thing. But was, it, was that with you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, sorry, what's your name again? Did he, did he react to uh, being sworn in? Yeah, no, he doesn't. Okay, Lenny. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite catch you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Lenny. That's a fun thing to put on your Astro server to mess with stuff. I got a blog up that shows you how to connect all this stuff up. So I'll share the link in the Slack for people. Be that would be hilarious. <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. So that's what I have as far as equipment. If you guys got any questions, ask away, and you're more than welcome to come up and play with the stuff. And All right, you need an Astra server okay. to run it. They, they, they use the SIP protocol. Mm -hmm. So set up an Astra server in. I use FreePBX. Mm -hmm. It just makes it a lot easier. I don't like hand editing config files because I'm lazy like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, have them, I have them connected via SIP. The, the Linksys ones do not support rotary dial. Mm -hmm. So you can connect them up to an Astra box and use all the old touchstone phones on them. Mm -hmm. that linked into my Google Voice number. Mm -hmm. um, and then Google Voice changed the way that they were handling something. And yep. They, they got rid of um, XMPP. Yeah, it broke uh, Google Voice support and, and asterisk. It broke the asterisk support. So the, the gateway, people that were providing the gateway were like, well, we can't do this for free anymore, so we're going to turn it off. So I had to get rid of it. But um, it, I was able to answer from a rotary phone. I just couldn't. Right, they don't support they don't support pulse dial. The grand stream ones do. I'll have a I'll have a thing a page up on my blog tomorrow with all the supported analog telephone adapters mm -hmm. that do. I have two of those that I picked up for like fifty cents a piece. So you know. They can get a twenty five hundred set, which is uh, they're just a touch tone version, or even they make touch tones in Princess. Mm -hmm. Hook a payphone to it. Mm -hmm. I mean the possibilities are endless. Yeah. So they're they're a good little device. They support two lines. Okay. The grand stream supports two lines. This is an HT eight hundred two. If I disconnect the line coming in from the phone company, does that have enough voltage to feed the house? Yep, it'll feed the house. It'll it'll feed four or five phones. Okay, cool. So they'll all be on the same extension, but mm -hmm. just uh, connect your tip and ring, and away you go, red and green. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to remember when you're working with single phones is red and green. Yep. Cool. I mean, when you get into the bigger stuff like 1A2 and the key systems like I have, then you're dealing with 25 pair, and that's mm -hmm. remembering the 25 pair color code's tough. Huh? Blue, blue, yeah, that's good. I should remember it like that. I'm always looking at my cheat sheet when I'm punching down 25 pair. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> so I can, uh, I'll show you guys the uh, Phone Collectors International, too. That's a great resource for all this. So let me, did we lose the signal? Oh, my laptop went to sleep, probably. All right, disconnect this, reconnect to Wi-Fi. Yeah, Never heard of those.
know why they go with that. I'm gonna have to find one because I'd love to get that Japanese payphone working. All right, so this is Telephone Collectors International. It's a group of guys. They're mainly older. They the, want to get young blood involved into collecting telephones because there's a, that's a big part of our history, you know. If it wasn't for Ma Bell, we wouldn't have probably have computers. If it wasn't for the innovations at Bell Labs and stuff, we wouldn't be where we are today. But the nice thing about this is it's got this li this wonderful library. It shows you all the be like bell system practices. So anything and everything. So like here is one of the latest ones that come up. This is a teletype service manual for a teletype, and it's all scanned in right there, so you can. So if you got some legacy equipment that you're working on, the telephone collector's library is well worth it. It's just a good resource. I want, a tele I want a teletype really bad, but I don't have room for it yet. I want an ASR 33. Oh, do you think that the, uh, the uh, will go out? Oh, boy. But uh, also, Telephone Collectors International does shows every year all over, too. Oh, yeah. Yep. They're <laughs> you get to, because that's where you, find, that's where you find the good deals on the pay phones and everything else. All right, where's our shows and events? But yeah, that's a good resource. Uh, let me go to Paul F's telephone page. Find his. This should be Paul. Yep. And this this helps you find. This helps you look. Let's say you get a phone. This helps you identify it. It tells you exactly what what there is there. Like it shows you how to. It shows you the 500 sets without the dial. It shows you how to identify them. I mean, and they came in multiple colors. If you don't like black, they came in every color of the rainbow. But these are the 500 series, 500 type sets. And it just, this is a really good resource, but. And then there's the Antique Telephone Collectors Association. There's two of them. And they, that's also, they, you can become a member. It's something like 10 bucks a year for dues. TCI membership's 15, but it gives you access to everything in that library. So every, every bell system practice ever scanned from the early th turn of the century on is there. But like in April, there'll be a show coming up in uh, Shipshawan, Indiana. Mm -hmm. that's, just a, that's just a spring show. Everybody brings out their gear to swap, and we have fun, and stuff our face with pizza and good Amish food. And, Oh, go right ahead. Just kind of a description of like what's all on the box. I'm still trying to figure that out. Okay, all right. I know how to make it make music, and that's. I'm still trying to figure it all out. I have read the manual, but. So you're not gonna be able to scream otherwise. Okay. I mean, what So, I say oh the. Uh, Trunk type here on the left side here, so when you ordered a trunk from AT&T or any type of line from AT&T, uh, it came in a variety of different things. If you had it for your home, it was just a, just a loop start. So uh, essentially a loop start circuit is when you're, when you go off hook or you want to send a call in, you generate just ring voltage. So you just, you put voltage along the line. So it's, you're, you're connecting a loop. Um, there's other types, that when you're connecting to different types of PBXs, 
there's different types of uh, loop circuits. So every company had their own. One of the issues you have with phone systems is when you are receiving a phone call at the same time you are sending a phone call. You have a situation called glare, meaning that call coming in gets accidentally connected to somebody trying to go out at the same time. So all the different vendors had different ways that they dealt with glare. So you, had, you ordered a phone line from, let's say, AT&T and said, I need a uh, ground start. I need a, an E&M. I need a, a, one of these different types of trunks. And that had to be compatible with the equipment that you had uh, for, to prevent glare. So essentially, this over here allows you to set what type of uh, trunk you're actually terminating on. Because, you know, so they have a wink start where essentially you cross the line twice before you want to start using it. Okay. So essentially, you, you reverse the polarity. Uh, you could have ground start, meaning instead of creating a loop, so essentially like shorting out the circuit, you send it to ground. Um, they have ENM, which is ear and mouth. Uh, so essentially, that's a four wire circuit, so you have a separate path for sending and receiving. Um, I don't know what SF is on this. That's for a 2600 here. hertz trunk. Oh, okay, so that's a so that's a CO to CO trunk. Yep. So essentially SF would be, they use different multi-frequency uh, signals between the, uh, the central offices to identify what line you're on, what you're dialing, and what the billing code is, because those could be different. Um, so the functions, you got monitor, which is going to be essentially just like a butt set, so you're just hearing what's going on. Uh, manual send, auto send, uh, repeat send, these are essentially like redials, auto dials, and so to be able to dial codes on there. Mm -hmm. uh, the pulsing type, uh, multi-frequency, so that's DTMF. Uh, touch tone, also, well, DTMF. So multi-frequency is a, is a, instead of mixing it with 1600 hertz, you mix it with 2400 hertz. So essentially all the tones actually sound higher. But that was the, quote, secret uh, technology that they sent between uh, COs so that you on your regular phone couldn't bill somebody else. Uh, DP, I'm not sure what Dial is. Dial pulse. Dial pulse, okay. Yep, for. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Uh, supervision control, so this is how are you terminating or not terminating a call. So a typical call, let's say on, an, on a uh, normal wink start circuit, you can just ground the line when you're done, and then that would be unsupervised. Or you can actually send winks at the end to say, okay, now my call is done. I'm ready for another call to come in. So this is all about like, you know, how you connect with different uh, PBXs and that type of stuff. Um, cool. I'm trying to think what other things are. What would you use it for? So this is for alignment. So this one here is really for. Uh, it, not an old version. So the guy, this guy here. So oh, this is real. Yeah. Yeah. Blue yeah. Yeah. So this guy over here is just a is a lineman butt set from probably the fifties. That's seventies. So seventies. Yeah, it's a Canadian one. Okay. Northern Telecom. Okay. So this yeah. is about the fifties. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely Nortel. But, um, but essentially, this one here is something that a lineman would just carry around, and then they can clip in somewhere and place a phone call. The problem would be this guy here couldn't only did uh, loop start circuits, so only did circuits that would be like t for your home. Mm -hmm. So when you start dealing with a company system or a multi-line system, things That's like that, you had to have all the additional features. Oh. So it's, it's, yeah, so essentially <laughs> this, so this over here would be really for, you know, the person who's fixing a line at a business, which is a lot less common. Um, or working between COs, this one here does have the CO functionality as well. So if you're going between one central office and the other central office and you're trying to figure out what's going on, you can put this on here too. Now I'm seeing here that this probably has some T1 testing capabilities as well. Yep. Or a BRI or something. I don't see exactly where you'd plug that in. Um, yeah, because it's got the drop-in insert. So this probably has somewhere... No, I think it just all connects. It all connects via the oh, TRS just, jacks up front. Okay, so it's all, it's all just the uh, yeah. So in theory, you could also put a ISDN or a T1 on this and be able to ch uh, select what channel you're going to jump onto and then do a drop and insert. So essentially, on a T1, which is 24 channels, you can say I want to jump onto channel 13 and test that particular line. So that would be for like the high density lines coming into a phone system or something like that. 
Well, I learned something new. I didn't know much about this thing. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I have a really important question. Where do you find this stuff? I go to phone shows and we go to antique shops and she got her she got her phone booth off Facebook Marketplace, guys. She put a one at old phones and he's like, I got a booth. Honest, honestly, a lot of this stuff here you're going to find like it like uh, the last weekend uh, the state of Michigan just had a big sale, like a surplus sale of, and this stuff just ends up going there. You know, so a lot of the surplus sales. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, people find, it in people find yeah, I mean, like the uh, state of Michigan moved out of the building over in South Penn over there, and they still had two A1 keys sitting there, and all that stuff went to surplus. If I'd have known that, I'd have been down there, because I love 1A2 stuff. Yeah, well, they're all mercury switches, so those are tough to move around, because you have to have hazmat certifications oh, to geez. move around, so. <laughs> I've got two A1 keys downstairs, too, here, so that it costs more for me to get rid of them than it does. Oh, geez. <laughs> so. Uh, how big is your trunk? It'll fit in a truck. <laughs> so a, a 10 line system is about this tall, this wide, and it's, it's in an A-frame. So, and uh, it's got all these mercury switches. So essentially when you have the old, you don't have a, yeah, you don't have it. Oh, I didn't yeah, bring a multi-line. Okay, you didn't say you didn't bring an A1 key. But essentially you have like a, uh, the, the multi-selector on there. You do that, that'd be a dedicated pair of wires going downstairs. And then you had the, the rotary that you would go do on there, and it's essentially like a kind of like a mini crossbar. Yep. The thing would fall down every for every click that's yep, going that's in there, a step and switch. then yeah, so it's a crossbar step switch. Yeah. Yep. So they're pretty much a mini version of that. Some integrated circuits in there, but essentially they used uh, mercury switches to flip over to reset the thing coming back up. But they're full of mercury. They're they're extremely hazardous. Except that he moved to Virginia. I know a guy who went to an estate sale and bought a XY tester. Oh, nice. And he didn't know quite what it was when he got it, and so he had to find, he found a YouTube video of one working. Oh, but, geez. yeah, he moved to Virginia, so I, I can't yeah. tell you how to get a hold of him. You start, <laughs> you, you start messing with switching, and it, it's a rabbit hole. I mean, you start yeah. building, you end up with a whole basement full of step. You go to my friend's place over in Millington, and you walk in his basement, and it's wall-to-wall -wall step he's got. It's really cool to play with because you can pick up on his phone. You pick up one of his, pick up one of the phone, dial the call, and watch it step through the selectors and the connectors and yeah. process the call. That's cool. So this They're is loud. My, my silly question. So colloquially, a glue, a, a blue box is the thing that makes the 2600 hertz tone, so that you can, you know, make a free phone call to the Pope. But is yeah. that is that based off of that box there? No. So it's it's really ba no so. Uh, Freakers. For like red box and black box. So Freakers back in the day, there was a whole game of trying to figure out what, how the how the phone company communicated with each other. So the phone company, uh, they built up central offices. So built, you know, essentially they call wire centers. The phone lines that went to your house went to this, you know, big system there, and it went to either a stepper switch or it went to, you know, the new modern ones with either one ESS or five ESS. This area over here, they have a lot of DMS switches, so those are done by Northern Telecom. But essentially, they go to this wire center, and then once it went into the system, the uh, phone companies had dedicated phone lines going to other switches. So uh, if you were in this area here, so East Lansing in particular, you'd go to East Lansing, Maine. From there, it would be wired up. The next tandem switch would be going to um, Lansing, Maine, and then the uh, alternate path would be going to Flint. So these big trunk lines, essentially, the older systems, they had everything that was in-band signaling. So uh, these crazy tones that you'd hear coming out of these types of things here uh, would dictate what number you're calling, what number you're calling from, billing codes, which was the most important thing, <laughs> and, um, and all that type of stuff. So there was big projects back in the early 80s where freakers were trying to map out how these things actually connected. And essentially, they didn't have access to the documentation that's now out there in the public. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were trying to map out how all this stuff worked. Uh, 2600 happened to be the Hertz tone for a 25 cent piece going into a payphone or any rate line, uh, rate line system. So if you had a, any type of, um, or that was a red box. Really, yeah, red box. Yeah, yeah say the, red, the red box, uh, essentially there was a, a tone when you put in a 25 cent piece, it would make a certain tone. 
the really early pay phones, you can actually hear that tone when you put in the, yep, the coin. Yeah, I've actually got one of my 1Cs at home. You put the quarter in, you can hear the tones. Yeah, and essentially the central office would listen for that tone and say, okay, now you're going to make a call. Well, 2600 hertz is, you know, in a lot of these boxes, essentially they just emulated those in-band tones. Now, AT&T and a lot of the Lex got wise to this in the mid-90s and said, hey, maybe this out-of-band stuff or the in-band stuff is really not what we need to be doing. So they started uh, doing out-of-band signaling. So they had originally SS2, and then they upgraded to SS7, which is an out-of-band signaling to do all that billing code and the rate codes and all that stuff. Yeah, I raised all kinds of, I raised all kinds of cane with my uh, red box. That was yeah. fun. We all did. Yeah, we all did. We all did. It was used to. It was always fun taking a homemade butt set and jumping on your neighbor's pair and listening to phone calls. And yep. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. And then you know, and if you were lucky enough to get find somebody with an ISDN, then you can get into some really cool stuff because you could do direct SS SS7 signaling to the CEO. Yep. That was even better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we had all the good stuff, including the Lyman set, and we had, there was a 1-800 number from my house, which maybe Susan maybe has, you know what I'm saying? I don't know, but there was a 1-800 number that we've been on my house for a long time. An 800 number is really, all the toll-free numbers, it's a virtual, um, it's a virtual area code owned by a company. So the original 800s were owned by Sprint. Um, but, there, good, but essentially it, yeah. but uh, the 800 number just points to a local phone number. Well, something going on with my dad had to be accessible because he was the telecom guy and so, right. had the, so I think there was also another line going on in there. Yep. He didn't explain to the 10-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> ISDNs were great because you could have as many phone numbers as you wanted going to, a, you know, to two lines. So essentially it was a digital circuit that went to that. It used to be affordable. Now you go to try to get a quote from AT&T for it. And well, AT&T doesn't uh, provide ISDNs anymore. A friend of mine's got a full T1 up in uh, California through AT&T right now. Yeah. He's, he's paying 500 bucks a month for it. I mean, we've got two OC3s here at MSU, so. Well, that's nice. And then moved everything. Pretty much everything's moved over to SIP at this point. But. Yeah, SIP is the way to go. But this is fun if you want to have that retro phone on your living room wall working or your kitchen wall. It's fun to have it, it hooked up. It's really nice and loud if you're on call or something. Yeah. It's really great. Well, that, I, I got 160 decibel loud ringer I could have bring. Yeah. It would have woke the dead. Yep. So well, that's all I have for you guys. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We on camera? We're good? Okay. So thank you very much, Steve. I really yeah, appreciate no it. This has been really fascinating. Uh, I do want to go over a couple other things because I forgot to mention them at the, at the start here. Ooh. I know, I know. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so Southfield. Um, in addition to Grand Rapids having their fun one about KringleCon uh, tomorrow, Southfield also has, oh gosh, I'm looking at the socials, not their meetup. Uh, what is it called here? Cubicles and Compromises, an incident response tabletop game. That one sounds pretty fun. Uh, you don't need to bring anything. It sounds like they're going to provide everything for you. They're going to have a, a set of cards and some dice and all that fun stuff, but uh, that, that'll be a lot of fun. I also wanted to mention our socials coming up. Uh, both Jackson and Lansing. I don't think Jackson will. Jackson is not happening. Lansing, we will have our social on December 18th instead of on Christmas Day. Uh, <laughs> okay, what else are you going to do? You know, like, uh, you should enjoy some time with uh, your loved ones on Christmas Day. Or, or, you know, just be lazy. Oh, whoa. Apparently, yeah, 8 o'clock. It's turning off on us. Timing. No, those, no, those um, videos. Are yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, oh, So... Jackson Social not happening, Lansing Social December 18th. Uh, all the other socials will be on for normal times. Uh, Southfield is meeting on December 26th at One Eye Betty's. And Grand Rapids, I do not have the exact details on, so see us in Slack and we can get you details on that. And of course, Detroit is on hiatus. Uh, with that said, once again, thank you very much, Steve and There's Ashley. No problem. Uh, yep. Uh, happy holidays, everybody. Safe travels, and we'll see you guys next year. All right.